Welcome everybody. My name is Thomas Werner Ferber. I'm from the Protestant Academy in Lokum. That's a church um, run dialogue flat platform here in, in Northern Germany. And normally I have to admit frankly that um, we do conferences face to face, but um, in these unusual times, even we are digital. It is Friday afternoon, but we have more than um, 100 people participating in our uh, webinar. Um, they come from different backgrounds, from different uh, locations, and all of them seems, seemed um, to be interested in learning, discussing um, more about uh, Syria and, and the Syrian conflict. That is absolutely great. That's the spirit um, that, we like to, that we like to see because it's the purpose of our webinar um, to have an overview on different dimension of the Syrian conflict. And today is the first session of a um, longer episode, which has in total five sessions. And um, the idea is, um, apart from giving an overview, to, um, well, to uh, contribute to keep the Syrian conflict high on the agenda, at least here in Germany and in Europe. Um, and for our uh, today's um, discussion, we have two um, excellent pan panelists with us. Both of them are a great um, asset to the discussion. And I'm excited to introduce to you, um, I don't know on which uh, window it is um, for you. For me, it's the middle window here at um, the, the, the Zoom screen. I, I, I'm excited to introduce to you, to you Sam Dacher. He is a journalist and an author who lived uh, quite some time in the Middle East. And he was the only um, non-Syrian reporter uh, for a major Western media outlet based um, full-time in Damascus during these critical years, 2012-2014. Uh, and Sam is currently contributing to The Atlantic and is a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. And he also um, is an author of a wonderful book, which I which kept me awake during the last um, two nights. I'm not fully. Com I have I don't, don't have uh, completed it fully, um, but uh, it's highly uh, um, uh, recommended um, to to buy and to read. Uh, the title is um, um, Assad or We Burn the Country: How um, How the Lust for uh, Power of a family destroyed um, Syria. And it was picked um, um, off by the um, Economist and to The Guardian as one of the best books, 2012. Thank you, Sam, for, for participating. It's absolutely great. And on the other window, um, we have uh, Tom, uh, Tobias Schneider. He is a research fellow at the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin. He is, um, his research interests are um, on um, insurgencies and counterinsurgencies in the Middle East. And related to that, he is interested in um, security sector reforms, um, and the, uh, the economy of uh, conflicts, and um, the structure of states. And Prior, and he's working for an institute that is called uh, Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin. Berlin. The acronym is uh, GPPI. And before joining the GPPI, he worked in Washington, D.C. for the World Bank and for the Center for European Policy Analysis and also for an institution that is called IHS Market. And it's, it's important to uh, mention that he's also a co-editor of an, well, a weekly subscription, subscription publication outlet that is covering uh, humanitarian and security policy development in and around Syria. And these, this, um, this publication is called Syria in Context. Highly recommended to subscribe. It's, uh, uh, um, well invested um, to and give you a, a very rich overview um, on the situation on the ground. And thank you, Tobias, for, for joining us. And of course, thank you to all of you um, 
participants out there um, to, to, um, to be on board for our first uh, webinar session. Um, I highly recommend you that you participate um, using the Q&A function where I, uh, um, I will um, gather all these questions from you and I will try to cluster them a bit. And um, we have um, 40 minutes of moderated discussion and um, 20 minutes um, for Q&A. So there will be enough time to, for um, our two panelists to go more deeply into your questions. Um, let me also say a couple of words um, before we then start um about um the idea of our today's first webinar the title as you might have recognized um it is um assad the regime and the logic of the war and you um might have recognized that there is a lot of regime and assad in the title obviously um, and honestly, um, a couple of months or years ago, I would have chosen a different focus um, for our first webinar session. But I thought to myself that um, given that um, the government in Damascus has retaken um, considerable, considerable um, uh, amounts, uh, retaken considerable amounts of the um, territory in Syria, and is about to win at least militarily the conflict, it is crucial to talk again about um, the regime and Damascus, the inner logic, who is he, what is um, he about, in particular because, um, at least here in Europe, there's a lot of debate going on about the question, is it possible to cut some sort of deal with um, Assad, given that he is about to win the war. So that was the idea. And um, of, for our first um, seminar, we, um, I would like to structure the moderated discussion in four parts. So first, um, I would like to, to ask the panelists to give a brief overview um, of the last uh, uh, five, nine years of conflict. So what were the major turning points and events? Afterwards, I would like to dive a bit into the inner circle of the Assad regime. Who is he? Who is his entourage? And then we come to um, the logic of the war. How is it structured? What makes the Syrian conflict unique? And what are the trends and developments within the course of violence? And finally, I would like to wrap up and then start uh, the Q&A. So maybe we start with you, Sam. I would like to kick up, kick off um, the introductory um, part of our session um, by asking you, uh, well, to give us a very brief overview of the conflict and in particular from your uh, perspective as a journalist, since you were based during the critical times of the conflict um, in Damascus and um, what is your take as a journalist, your view as a journalist on the very beginning of the conflict and then the, um, the, its involvement. And of course, to be as you are always um, very much uh, welcomed to, to kick in and add uh, your thoughts. So please, Sam, um, it's your take. The world was seeing, you know, the revolution uh, through these YouTube videos because, I mean, the regime was, was not allowing journalists to go to these places. So citizen journalists want to tell the world what was happening and to document you know, the, the, the atrocities and the war crimes of the regime. Uh, in the West, the reaction was uh, Assad had to go. He lost legitimacy. I mean, this is what uh, uh, Chancellor uh, uh, Merkel said. Uh, but the decision was, uh, let's have the UN and the Arab League solve the problem. And let's see if we can, we can have, we solve the problem that way. Forgetting that these organizations are ineffectual in the, you know, in the best of circumstances. So this really showed little understanding uh, by Western countries of the savage nature of this regime. And it really opened the way to foreign, uh, to regional powers to get involved in, in, in a much deeper way. You had Turkey and Qatar um, who had their own agenda during the Arab Spring. I mean, they wanted to co-opt uh, these protests that, that were happening in the, in the region in order to install their Islamist allies in power, particularly the Muslim Brotherhood. So that they jumped right in uh, funding uh, both the military, the, the 
arm of the of the uh, revolution, uh, the rebels, you know, who started off as as army defectors, organizing, you know, these uh, uh, ragtag groups. I would call them to protect their own neighborhoods, and also funding the opposition uh, in exile. And the Saudis decided to go in as well, both to compete with the Qatar and Turkey, and also to confront Iran, which was helping the regime from day one. Uh, in the context of all of this, uh, you had uh, it, the situation in Iraq next door. The Americans had just left. Uh, the, the prime minister went after the Sunnis, thinking they were conspiring to bring down his, his, his government. Uh, that, uh, what you know was almost oxygen to Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, they immediately began to uh, prepare to go into Syria. You had the Nusra Front in the beginning, which was uh, kind of the, the 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 franchise of Al Qaeda in Iraq in Syria. Then they they split in the uh, uh, spring of 2013, and Abu Bakr al Baghdadi announced uh, the creation of ISIS. Uh, uh, at the time, Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Uh, in tandem, the regime had, you know, right around that time, the regime had abandoned, uh, uh, you know, large territories on the border with Iraq that were taken over by ISIS. And also the regime was pursuing a scorched earth campaign against all opposition areas. Uh, with the help of Iran and Hezbollah from Lebanon, they would uh, besiege entire towns and neighborhoods bomb them, uh, you know, day and night, prevent any medicine and, and, and food from going in, and then, you know, have, have these areas surrender, uh, getting back destroyed and deserted uh, uh, towns and neighborhoods. Uh, also in the summer of, of 2013, we saw the regime use uh, chemical weapons on a large scale in uh, suburban Damascus which resulted in the, in the death of uh, almost uh, 1,500 people. It, it had already started using chemical weapons on a small scale in December 2012. Uh, the, the, West, the West reacted by saying, well, if you destroy the weapons, I mean, we won't go after you and uh, Russia can guarantee this. And we know that this was all a sham. The regime ended up keeping its, it, you know, part of its weapons. Um, to deploy them in the future. But the message, you know, was clear that, at, at least for Assad, that he can kill his people with impunity. No, one, no one's going to go after him. And this was a very uh, potent, I said, I would say, recruitment tool for uh, militants in, in, in Syria, whether it's Nusra Front or, or ISIS, because they could say, look, the West says, you know, they care about you and they want to help you. But they, and look what they did. They just allowed Bashar al-Assad to get away with you know, the chemical weapons attack. So this was really a, a recruitment tool for, 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 the, for the extremists. Then you had the attacks in, in the West, in, in, in Paris and in Berlin and elsewhere. Uh, you had the refugees, but I think those were consequences and symptoms of, 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 of the problem, not, not the problem itself. And I think this is, this is often, you know, in, in the West, you know, these two are conflated. And I think that's really the problem. And then the logic became is like, you know, Bashar is horrible, he's a butcher, but what's the alternative, you know, ISIS. So you have this sort of binary again, which I think is, 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 is false. Uh, so what you have is now, you know, a fractured country, uh, divided. Uh, Bashar uh, al-Assad is in control of, uh, of most of the, uh, you know, territories. But when I say in control, there's a huge caveat here. He's propped up by Iran and Russia. The moment they withdraw their support, he will, he will fall, he will collapse. So you have uh, uh, another section of the country in the Northeast controlled by uh, Kurdish militias with the help of the US. You have Turkey in, in control of areas, you know, in the North and in, in the North uh, West around Idlib. Uh, the economy is in tatters. Uh, people are back on the streets. This is why I told you, you know, in some areas in Sweden, people are, are chanting against the regime. So we're almost back to, to square one. I mean, the same grievances that people that, that, that uh, you know, triggered the, the protest in 2011 are there. And the situation is, is much worse, both for the regime and for the people. Uh, the death toll, I mean, in 2016, I was told, 
a, uh, by the UN uh, uh, envoy for Syria at the time, Stefan de Mistura, that it was more than 400,000. Then now most people would agree it's more than half a million. There's one study that said it could be close to 700,000. Half the population is either displaced internally or outside the country. Um, really, you, you, have, you have a catastrophic situation and anything can happen now uh, that would trigger maybe another refugee crisis. We are seeing ISIS come back in Iraq, that, I mean, which in time could mean, you know, they could come back to Syria as well. So, you know, all of the underlying causes of this problem have not been resolved and they won't be resolved as, as long as this regime remains there. And with that, I would uh, hand it over to my colleague. Yeah, please, Tobias. Many thanks for, for that very brief sure. overview. Uh, I mean, nine years in 10 minutes. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, yeah, I think, I think, I think yeah. Sam gave a sort of very, very um, um, good summary of, of the key events. And the, I think the key, um, not just the turning points, but also the key sort of framings that emerged throughout the conflict about you know, how this, you know, what is really extraordinary destruction of a country, as you, you know, say in the title of your book, on behalf of a very small ruling clique and its sort of various patronage systems that, that underpin it and the security sector that underpins it. Um, if I ever had to write a book, I would call it something similar. I would call it sort of a history of violence, a sort of brutalization of, of a country and a sort of destruction of a social fabric um, that started in 2011 with the suppression of a revolution. Um, and that systematically, I think, in order to, to, to prevent people or in order to prevent any sort of opposition or parallel governance project or any, you know, anything that, that, could, that could break up that dichotomy that the, that, the, that the Syrian government wanted to see both externally but also see in the minds of its own people between themselves and chaos, anything that could provide an alternative to that um, um, sort of yeah, dichotomy. Um, it kicked out the and sort of the legs of each of, of all of these actors of which it could stand, be it um, you know homes and housing and displaced people, um, be it uh, the economy, be it sort of basic sort of social cohesion and welfare by poisoning the discourse, uh, sectarianism. It's it's an, it's an extraordinary um, pattern of so I suppose societal cannibalization um, in a sense. Uh, by 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 the time. From the very beginning, you have a, a revolution, a revolution that is morphed into a civil war through sort of incitement um, and mobilization from a civil war. Um, you see a sort of slow destruction of this fabric until even the civil war actors can't really sustain themselves anymore. So from 2015, on neither side was really able to finance and support the war by itself. So you get the increasing reliance of external actors. So you get a regional proxy war. You get the, the selling off of the last China, the last savings. Uh, the Washington Post had a great article the other day about Syrian women selling off um, their last sort of gold possessions and jewelry because really the country has uh, destroyed whatever productive economy, whatever sort of capital stock it still had. Uh, I think three years ago, the second largest export of Syria was copper wire, uh, which is what sort of ripped out of the ground um, when looting reconquered the territories. It's a complete destruction. Um, of society and its social fabric. And they sort of one last uh, sort of key point to the, in my biography at the World Bank, I did two big things for the World Bank. One thing I worked on was a study called the Toll of War, which was the first comprehensive analysis of the impact of the conflict on the economy of Syria. And I'm, I didn't do the econometrics of it at all, but there were very, very smart people who did that. And they did uh, ch channels of impact. In that. They disaggregated what channels did how much damage to the Syrian economy. And they uh, disaggregated between capital damage, so destruction of housing stock and factories and so on, uh, casualties, so the destruction of humans, and third, what they call um, disorganization, social and economic disorganization, sort of destruction of a social fabric of trust between people, of trading relationships, the sort of thing that makes up a society. And the capital stock accounted for only 5% of the damage. 95% is the violence meted out against the Syrian people. And the, Syrian, and the violence meted out against the Syrian people was to almost the exact same share meted out by the Syrian government. Um, it, was a, it was an extraordinary, I think, decision. And as, as Sam pointed out, uh, um, you know, earlier in 2013, or 13, 2013 was really the crux moment from which it became absolutely clear that from a Western perspective, at least, 
what I would call state preservation became the principal object. Um, and around that, everything else had to be organized. Thank you. Um, you already, both of you already mentioned it a bit, but now I want to, to go to our second part of um, the, the, the moderation and look more into who is Assad, who is the regime, who is his entourage, to a bit understand um, so the inner, the inner circle. And could you maybe elaborate a bit, uh, Sam, since you touched a lot of in, in your book about the, who are the influential people around Assad and how important is he? Is he just a puppet on a string or a, a, a string puller? So maybe you can, can, can say a word about it. Sure. Uh, I mean, great, great remarks by, by uh, Tobias. I think I would, just like the conflict itself uh, has evolved, I think he, Bashar al-Assad as a per person, has evolved you know, through the years. This is somebody who was, a, who was the reluctant, unlikely heir to his father's uh, throne. Uh, he was a painfully shy kid. Uh, marginalized in the family, tormented by his own father, and also the strong characters of his uh, eldest sister, Bushra, and his uh, uh, eldest brother, uh, Basil, who was being groomed to take power from his father. So when he went uh, off to London to um, study ophthalmology, he was very happy to uh, be out of this family dynamic. And he, in fact, he wanted to stay in, 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 uh, in Britain. But then his uh, eldest brother, Basil, is killed in a car crash. He's summoned back to Damascus. He's put into this uh, crash course on, you know, how to be the, uh, the next dictator of, of, of Syria. Uh, I mean, everything was custom made for him down to his uh, the time he spent at the military academy, uh, but the, his father had some really excellent mentors uh, to guide him through. Uh, people like uh, Mustafa Klaas, uh, who is one of you know his, his son is one of the main characters in the book, and other people like uh, uh, Muhammad Nasif, uh, one of the most brutal uh, security chiefs in the country who was uh, almost like the godfather of the Assad ch children. In fact, Bashar had a better relationship with Hamad Nasif than with his own father. And this, is, this, this figure was, was very important in Bashar's life because this is somebody who is, his whole job is how to ensure the survival of this regime and this family. And somebody who was uh, one of the architects of the, of the crackdown in the 70s and, and early 80s you know, that, that Hafez al-Assad uh, uh, launched uh, because, I mean, a few people remember this in, in the late 70s, Hafez al-Assad fa fa faced an existential threat to his regime, both from uh, Islamist uh, insurgents, but also from, uh, you know, wide cross sections of the population. Uh, and he decided uh, to go after uh, both uh, you know, under the guise of fight, fighting terrorism, very much like what his son would do uh, starting in 2011. So this, this really informed Bashar, I mean, from a very young age, because he lived through it. And then uh, this mentor was guiding him through this, you know, the, the, the number one lesson that you do everything to ensure, you know, the, 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 the survival of this regime. Even when he was presented to the, to Bashar al-Assad was presented to, the, to his people, and to the world as a reformist, it was basically an effort to repackage the regime. Yes, he, he's a reformist, but it, you know, as long as this really serves the regime and ensures its survival. And, and you have to remember, this is coming in the context of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, so all of these you know, uh, measures were intentional on the part of the regime. And, He's embraced by Syrians in the beginning as uh, somebody who's go going to be very different from his father, uh, somebody who's going to open up the country. But very quickly, I mean, he realizes that any small concession, any small opening will mean the beginning of the end. And he quickly shuts it down. This is a period known as the Damascus Spring between mm -hmm. 2000 and 2001. And then all, we begin to see him consolidate power uh, you see a lot of what he, what he himself called the old guard, people who are left over from his father's era are retired uh, or in some instances killed, you know, in, in mysterious circumstances. And then you see the consolidation of power in his own hands and also uh, 
in the hands of this tight inner circle around him, which is made up of members of the family, uh, from members of the Assad family, and also the extended family, like the Makhlouf's and the Shalish uh, family and other families. And then we see things begin to change again and evolve in 2005, when um, uh, the regime is under sanctions because of its suspected role in the assassination of Rafiq al-Hariri, the former prime minister in Lebanon, and also because of its role in supporting the insurgency in Iraq, because Bashar felt if the Americans sink in the mud of Iraq, they would think twice uh, about you know, coming after him. So he was supporting both you know, the, the nationalist insurgents, uh, uh, pro-Saddam insurgents, and also the Islamists, inclu including al-Qaeda in Iraq. So uh, he was sanctioned because of these two things. But then uh, we begin to see the role of Iran and Hezbollah really rise. Uh, they begin to embed themselves in the regime. They're there to uh, prop him up. He is uh, fascinated uh, uh, by the personality of Hassan Nasrallah as you know, the, the, the uh, uh, Secretary, uh, General, uh, Secretary of Hezbollah. Um, he looks up to him as a mentor, as, a, as, as, a, as a, an example to emulate. Uh, he, he fancies himself as being, Bashar al-Assad, as being uh, uh, a commander or leader in this axis of resistance uh, that includes, uh, that's led by Iran and that includes Hezbollah and Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and other parts of the Middle East. So in 2011, you, see, you can say he's, he's really ready to take on this role at, you know, uh, to, to really defend the regime at any cost. Okay, okay. And um, since you mentioned already a bit um, the, the growing, the, the restarting of demonstration, you mentioned the Maglouves and so on. How stable is, is the economic crisis as well at the moment? How stable is the regime at the moment? Um, um, since there was rumors going on, well, um, it might could collapse even today. Is, is that an option or is that an, an outcome um, with the restarting? Maybe to be as, um, uh, since you were smiling, <laughs> <I guess. laughs> please, could you? Um, because there was the, in particular, the, the Makhlouf uh, rumors and so on. Makhlouf is, I mean, I imagine Sam knows him better, but from everything I know, Makhlouf is a coward. Um, and the days, I think, so we do quite a lot of work these days on, on social discontent and, um, and the, the economic situation. So I do think the economic situation is as bad as, as it has ever been and potentially as it is anywhere in the world right now. And I want to say this right now, I do think there's a severe chance of famine later this year, at the end of this year. I think the Syrian government has failed to procure wheat uh, this year and it won't be able to make up the difference. Um, and we are facing a huge um, uh, humanitarian catastrophe at the end of this year, just to, to throw that out first of all. Um, I do not yet see this translating over into political mobilization that could meaningfully replace the regime. I do think that there's people angling inside the regime inner circle trying to position themselves, but I don't see that succeed. I think basically they're positioning themselves for Russia. So I think there's a sense that if the Russians or the Iranians were to pick us, we would be able to you know, put a new face to this regime and we would be able to get some of the sanctions lifted and therefore you'd be able to faster normalize this whole process. I don't think the Russians have any interest in my dealing with the Russians, at least I've never heard anything of the sort, any interest in, in replacing Bashar al-Assad. Um, I don't think that the Russians have any interest, even frankly, in propping up the government as such, because I don't want to get pulled that deeply into this problem. Um, I do think that the government still holds all the levers. It still holds basically, it, it's about to lose it, but it still holds a monopoly on the central bank and, um, and Forex uh, entry. Um, is as weak as it has ever been economically, but I don't see that translating into a fall of the regime. That does not mean that what we won't see is a sort of breakdown of general social order. So we will see a rise in brigandage, so we will see a lot more theft, a highway robbery of um, what the Syrian government basically did was its military defected throughout the war because it's only conscripts. So it replaced it with a whole bunch of loyalist militias who are really the worst kind of thugs imaginable, who have already fleeced the country dry um, and who are sort of going to be increasingly competing over ever fewer resources. 
So whoever owns a gas station, whoever owns a major checkpoint, whoever has the import rights for whatever little goods that are still going to be imported, those few resources will be ever more precious to people with guns. And so I think we'll see a lot of horizontal conflict. We'll see a lot of um, warlords, a lot of sort of petty stakeholders fight it out uh, for control of turf. I don't think this moves up or down because I do think everybody lives and dies by Bashar al-Assad still. Um, that's my personal interpretation. I do think there's a lot of variables, including the situation in Iraq. I do think that um, Lebanon is a huge variable in, in how this uh, could potentially play out. Um, I don't think the cards have all fallen. I do think we might uh, see another offensive in the Northwest, uh, who knows. Um, I don't think the situation is, I think the situation is as bad as it's ever been. I don't think it directly threatens the Syrian government. Okay, okay. Um, so if we, if we still, Belarus is stable, and on the other hand, um, winning with the support of Russia and Iran, um, is this winning and losing approach to the Syrian war? Um, because many people say, well, Assad is winning and uh, is, is, uh, the, the conflict is soon over. Is this winning, losing approach the right way to think about the Syrian war? Because it, it's, uh, it seems that without, um, with uh, Idlib as the only stronghold left, um, it will be come to an end soon, maybe. Um, how is how this, can we maybe elaborate a bit, both of you, on this winning, losing um, approach or uh, paradigm on the Syrian war? My personal view is that um, you only really lose from economic collapse if you care about the Syrian people. Um, and so Russia has been quite clear that obviously what it wants is normalization for somebody to pay, pick up the tab, but they're, they're not fundamentally going to get that involved and want those kinds of liabilities. Um, I think they have their sort of key positions staked out. They're in the army, in the intelligence service, they have the major ports. Um, phosphate production, whatever productive sector is left, they have basically monopolized or cornered, a couple of going to the Iranians, and they have their bases, um, and they are basically internationally the key power broker between any actor who wants to engage in Syria, be it Turkey, be it Israel, be it the United States, be it anyone. So everybody, all roads go through Moscow today. So I think from, mm -hmm. from, a, from a Russian perspective, with very, very little investment, frankly. Um, IKEA is a larger donor to the humanitarian response in Syria than Russia. Um, the, it's, a, it's a handful of jet planes and a couple of military police from the Caucasus um, that have fundamentally sort of reshuffled Russia's role in the Middle East. And so I think from, from their point of view, it's, it's clearly a success. I do think that there's rumblings in the foreign ministry that this uh, could become a liability, but I don't think it's there. Yet. Iran, I think, works perfectly fine in a you know, destroyed Syria. Um, Iran functions very much through state, I suppose, dissolution um, by building its own stakeholders within fraught societies and within fragmented societies as they did elsewhere. Um, I do think that they're quite secure in their alliance. Um, there's a lot of talk in Israel and so on about, their, about the ability of, um, of, of their ability to push Iran out of the country and that there's so much Arab resentment against Iran uh, that it, you know, eventually will be forced to depart by, you know, muted by sort of Arab disgust against Iran. I don't think that the regime can afford that. I think the regime understands that it can't afford that. Um, I think militarily, socially, politically, actors like Hezbollah are stronger than the Syrian central state today. So the, the power projection has reversed, frankly. Um, and so, and frankly, if Iran were to depart, uh, Syria would be, you know, at the mercy of Russia alone, and nobody wants that either. So it's a sort of, it's a high wire act for everybody involved. Um, but I don't think they have lost, uh, the ones who have lost are the Syrian people um, who are going to have to bear the brunt of all of this um, and who have very, 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 you know, there's no light at the end of this tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I'd be very careful about uh, using words like stable. Uh, you know, this regime is stable. I'd be also very careful about using the word victory to describe uh, the state of the regime because you're really, what you're doing, you're, you're, you're adopting the regime's own narrative and propaganda. I think, uh, yes, he has survived. We could say he has survived, uh, but at what cost at the end of the day? I mean, I just described to you the country is destroyed, fractured, half of the population is either outside or or displaced internally. We're talking about one third of the population outside the country, seven million. So we're, I think, in my opinion, uh, the, we're talking about a, a moribund regime, 
that's propped up by Iran and Russia, the moment you remove one of these pieces, the whole thing comes down like a house of cards. I think that's what you have now. And he's able to survive by playing off these patrons against one another. I, I think that's really at the heart of this. And, and we, we must focus on that. The way if, you know, Russia tells him, you know, make political concessions in Geneva, he leans on Iran, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Russia tells him, don't go after the rebels in Idlib. He leans on Iran. No, I have to go after them and I have to bomb them from the sky. Even his own army, he hasn't been able to reconstitute it because the, the, really the army unraveled in 2011. Soldiers and junior officers left the army. What, what remained were the senior officers who were mainly Alawites and the equipment, you know, the few jets that he has, the tanks and the artillery. That's really what remained. Till this day, even those who support Bashar al-Assad and love him and, and post his, his photo on their Facebook uh, pages do not want to serve in the army. They, they, they leave the country. I, I would say in, even in Germany, you have people that support him and are there because they don't want to serve in the army. Uh, so we have to be really careful when we talk about stability and, and victory. I think in my opinion, uh, this regime is, yes, it has survived, yes, it, it's managed to hang on, and yes, it will organize elections, you know, next year uh, that will bring back, barring any unforeseen circumstances, that will bring him back as president for another seven years. But you have to really keep in mind that he is there because th these two outside powers are still supporting him and he's able to play them off against each other. And also that has, uh, uh, this has allowed him to uh, uh, re re reimpose uh, his terror organs. Uh, you know, uh, we're talking about you know, the secret police and, and these intelligence services uh, back to uh, you know, terrorize Syrians and, and to make sure nobody says anything against the regime. But what we've seen in, in Sueda, I think, in, in southwest Syria should not be underestimated. People were, for the first time in years, coming out on the streets and chanting for the downfall of the regime. Uh, they're trying to do the same in, in next door in Dara, which is predominantly Sunni. They're trying to organize similar protests in other parts of the country, uh, like uh, Salamiya, which is predominantly Ismaili, another minority group. The people in Idlib are looking at these protests and also like uh, uh, trying to see how they can uh, liaise with, with, that, with protesters there. So I would say uh, the regime, again, to sum up, is at its weakest in the past mm. 20 years. Mm. Mm, I understand. And so with all that in mind, how, how would you react to um, um, the debate, which is, is growing, I think, in, in Germany and other European countries to, to, um, to somehow find a modus vivandi uh, with the Assad regime, um, maybe work towards uh, return of refugees and so on. I have the feeling that, 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 that I know already a bit the, the, the answer, but um, maybe, uh, maybe you can, can say it in some words uh, again, Tobias, please. Maybe, uh, uh, doubtless, uh, you, you oh, might... Sorry, I have my, my microphone off for now. Um, it's a discussion I have quite a lot, and I actually just came back from Parliament to have a very similar discussion. Um, first of all, we have a modus vivendi with the Syrian government. We have had one for the better part of seven years, at least now, um, when sort of the fundamental policy consensus, I think, in the West shifted. Um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, us having to move from our sort of demand for the removal of Bashar al-Assad. This, this is from people who don't actually read the documents. Um, our demand has not been the removal of Bashar al-Assad for years now. Our demand has been a constructive engagement in the political process in Geneva. Um, a political process that is, by the way, now guided by Russia. What we want is for the Syrian government to participate in the Constitutional Committee. The Constitutional Committee that was invented by the Russians that everybody knows is a farce. Like, no way, no, the, the current Syrian constitution offers all sorts of rights to its citizens. It's not, it, that, the legal text is not the problem. Um, and, and yet still they don't participate in that because for the Syrian government, it's not about that. It's about, it's about sovereignty and it's about sort of absolute victory. And I think from an absolute, from an absolute position, they think um, that they will be in a position to negotiate re-engagement on their own terms. Um, so if you right now try to deal with the Syrians, they don't want 
they don't want the refugees back. They don't want money on with strings attached. What they want is uh, to be in a position of, of absolute strength. And then they think that because of the refugee issue and sort of domestic political pressures and various other sorts of issues, um, that we will be basically begging them um, uh, to return to the fold and that we will all be flying back to Damascus. And I think they're fundamentally mistaken about that. It's my own reading of, of sort of, especially German internal politics. I do think that the European consensus on re-engagement with Bashar al-Assad actually holds um, quite well. I think the only governments who are fundamentally opposed to that are governments who A, don't host Syrians and B, weren't going to pay much money to go back anyway. So they're not going to go there. And even in countries like Germany, where we do have a lot of Syrians, A, Syrians aren't going to go back because you have to be absolute crazy person to go back to this, uh, to this uh, country right now. Um, you know, Syrians have German jobs, they have to learn the language, they have children in schools here. Um, you know, Syrian universities don't have people with college degrees, don't have teachers with college degrees, because everybody who could has left the country, right? Um, so I think the, the whole discussion is a little bit far from reality, and it's especially far off um, since yesterday, since the imposition of what the, uh, of uh, what's known as the Caesar Sanctions Act, Caesar Accountability Act, which passed in the United States, uh, which applies, applies a sort of swap of secondary sanctions on the Syrian government. Basically, it prevents not just engagement of uh, with, with Syrian government institutions, but also of third parties. It's a similar regime to what was applied on Iran, and it effectively shuts the door to any actor who would also want to engage in, for example, the international financial system from engaging with Syria, and that is pretty much everyone, um, including the sort of lukewarm people who've been sitting in you know, the Emirates and in Lebanon who've been sort of itching um, to go back to, to Damascus. So I, I do think what we're in for is a sort of long, cold winter um, of sort of mutual disinterest, um, a lot more violence, a lot more immiseration of the Syrian people. Um, and who knows what's going to happen in the medium term beyond that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I think we maybe we stop it here and go for the Q&A. Um, since I got uh, a lot of uh, interesting questions, maybe we start with uh, two questions which are uh, in the future look, if, sort of the future looking question. Um, one I have uh, for you. I just click it. I don't know whether you see it um, on the screen. Maybe not. Otherwise, I would read it to you. How do you see the future uh, for the next five to ten years for the Syrian people and economy? So. How is, is your take on that? Maybe who wants, wants to start with that? Or, or shall I read two questions so you can a bit uh, think? Um, the, the, the second um, um, future looking question would be um, an utopian one. Uh, so what would happen if Assad dies or leaves? Who will fill the gap? So maybe um, who wants for economy and who wants for the, for the gap? Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll take the first and Sam takes the second. Okay, uh, okay. With our respective expert. Um, as I said, I, I think I, I see a very dark future. Um, if you look at the Syrian economy, it's not about sanctions. If we did lift all sanctions on Syria tomorrow, the government, it would still not recover. There would still be, uh, even the collapse of the Syrian currency, which has lost 70% of its value in the last half year, is not due to sanctions. If we lifted the sanctions tomorrow, the Syrian central bank would not be a legitimate creditor on the international financial market. The Syrian government is involved in terror financing and it's not only being broke, it's involved in terror financing and narco trafficking and all sorts of international crime. Um, it's, it, it, it is what I outlined earlier, the complete destruction of Syria. It, it, and the reason we did the channel analysis of impact, what actually destroyed the Syrian country, and we talked about the destruction of the social fabric and the, of social trust and um, of, of, of human capital, is because that's what it takes to rebuild a society. You can stitch things together, you can pour a little bit of concrete, but you're not going to actually recover the country or recover a sort of you know, functional economic activity under the cured regime, especially not with all the predatory actors around who are sort of looking to cannibalize and looking to steal whatever is left and is uh, brought in. So I do think we're, we have a very sort of dark time ahead. And I do, as I mentioned, the prospect of famine in the country. I do think that a collapse of Lebanon which is sort of the last outlet uh, for, for the Syrian economy, where we have an estimate about $30 billion in uh, Syrian deposits in Lebanese banks, which have been used to finance what remains of Syrian imports. Um, these are basically under lock now, and they might get a haircut, and they might have to, under, the IMF, under an IMF agreement, open the books um, and then be subject to um, you know, proper, um, <coughs> um, I suppose, um, uh, due diligence and um, risk analysis. And so the, the Lebanese financial institutions are going to withdraw from the Syrian business. 
Um, I, I think you, you, have, you have a disastrous time ahead. In fact, I think Idlib might in the end become the most stable economic area in the country because Idlib has basic de facto, if the uh, crossings are open, it's in a, um, a, how do you call it, tariff union with the European Union because it's basically tied to Turkey. Um, and it has access to Forex via the Turkish Lira and uh, and Hayat Hashem and various movements on the market. They've set up banks. Um, and these banks are liquid. Um, there's a whole lot of other issues involved in that, but fundamentally, I think um, we're, we're going to be seeing a uh, you know, criminalized war, econ black market economy. I think we've seen an expansion of the drug uh, production, I think we'll see. Um, further banditry, I think we'll, 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 we might see if there were any openings left for the refugee waves, um, but the borders are closed, so who knows which direction that's going to go, maybe from Lebanon. Um, I, I, I see no light at the end of this tunnel, and importantly, I see very little that we can do to mitigate that, because as Sam said at the very, very beginning, all the drivers, all the root causes are not only still in place, they're all worse. The Syrian government today is worse than it was in 2011. It's narrower, it's more sectarian, it's more violent, it's poorer. Everything that drives violence has gotten worse. Um, and so I, I, I see very, very little hope. Sorry to be that negative about it. And um, Sam, maybe to the who fills the gap if, if Assad would leave or if the Russian makes them hear him leave and so on. Can we maybe give a, give a hint yeah, to, to that? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the Russians, we know that the Russians are, are grooming uh, generals, particularly uh, in the Alawite community, which is the, you know, the minority uh, community to which Bashar al-Assad belongs. And mm -hmm. they're concentrated in the coastal uh, region where Russia has its military uh, uh, bases. And, but I think if he were to uh, be decapitated or to fall or, or something hap would happen to him, I think uh, you would see um, a nightmare scenario, uh, further fragmentation in the country, in the areas uh, uh, that, were that are supposed to be nominally under regime control at the moment. Uh, you could see the Druze in the southwest trying to break off. You could see people in, the, in, in Dara, the tribal area, wanting to do the same. You could see even uh, the coastal region, uh, you know, try to, uh, you, you could see uh, rifts there coming to the surface uh, in, in connection to both the Mahlouf affair and also uh, other grievances uh, that have been building up, uh, you know, over, over the years and decades within the Alawite community itself. Uh, you could see the Kurds saying, this is our opportunity to have our own autonomous zone finally and, and right, you know, and to set it in stone. Uh, and you see, you could see the Turks retaliating by really going after them in a, in, in a bigger and, and a bloodier way and trying also to have their own uh, project of, of, of taking over, you know, a big chunk of northern Syria. And, and having you know the so-called uh, safe zone that would uh, allow Turkey to send back a lot of the Syrians that are now in Turkey into this area. Uh, so it, it would be really a nightmare scenario unless, and this is like the big caveat here, unless the Russians want to step in and take ownership of all of this. I mean, mm. I'm not saying just have a military base and, and, a, few, and, and a few generals and soldiers, but actually to send uh, you know, bureaucrats into the country to run the country, or, or if the Iranians want to do, to do this as well. Uh, and we could see the Iranians maybe having different ideas about who should be in control, and, and, and the Iranians and the Russians clashing over which direction you know, they should take. So really, I would say a nightmare, a nightmare scenario. Because I, this is, I, I think by design, Bashar really concentrated all the power in his hand at the moment uh, that, uh, would make everybody think twice, you know, about the consequences of removing him from power. Okay. Maybe now we, we move to a question that rather focus uh, more strongly on the nature of the war. So I have, for example, one um, that reads like photos. Do you believe the regime is strategically, strategically displacing civilians? And if yes, how is it benefiting from that strategy? Maybe that's going to you, to be us. And the other is, um, the link, uh, elaborate, um, elaborating more on the link between ISIS and the Assad regime, uh, would you agree that Assad 
as enabling um, of ISIS was critical for ISIS success in northern Iraq. Um, maybe these two questions on the more conflict uh, and nature of the Cold War. Maybe Tobias, would you go, go first? Well, the first one is basically the subject of most of our research work that we do here. We, we do a lot of work on weapon of indiscriminate weapons, uh, sort of the, the use of mass violence for political ends. So why would you target civilian populations in a civil war? Uh, is really, really the big question. There's a lot of historical literature on it, but let's talk about sort of Syria specifically. What happens in 2012, and as Sam, 2011, 2012, was, as Sam sort of outlined it, that the army largely abandoned the government because the army was a conscript army composed of, you know, Sunnis not especially interested in murdering their, you know, families and friends, uh, but also, you know, various other um, sects. Um, and so, pretty rapidly large swaths of the country fell out of control of the Syrian government. So what, what you always see in the news and, and what happens um, um, a lot of on social media is that you have a Syrian map and there's like a yellow and there's a green and there's a red zone. In practice, that's not what it looks like. If you think of the town or village where you come from, all it takes um, for the state to abandon an area, frankly, is for the teacher to no longer teach the government curriculum and for the mayor to sort of like get in his car and drive away and, you know, the police station to maybe change the flag or something. It's not, the state presence isn't always closely felt. And so this, the, 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 for, for a lot of people, very little changed. A lot of people stayed in their homes. And the battle was between, you know, a sort of a revolutionary vanguard, that you could say, that had a very broad base of popular support because the question was between Bashar al-Assad and not Bashar al-Assad. Um, and if the option is not Bashar al-Assad, most people will be happy to go for that. But if you didn't want to be involved in that, if you didn't want your children chased by the intelligence services, if you didn't want to have a knock coming, you know, protest during a day and a knock on your door at night, what you could do is you could stay home. You could remain in these areas and you could live your life and very little would change. Again, the teacher would teach a different curriculum and you pay uh, your taxes to a different mayor and you have to bribe a different local official, but fundamentally you could stay in these sorts of areas. And this is, in any civil conflict, a very large and important chunk of the population, including most sort of families, your grandmother, your, uh, you know, your daughter, your uncle, who's just sort of a mechanic. It's, it's a very, very diverse place, right? Um, and so if you, and so what happens in, in, in these areas is if the Syrian government loses control of them and a new authority comes in and they don't have the manpower to retake these areas, to effectively control, discriminately come at night and knock on people's doors, the only other option they have in their mind, I think, is to, you know, drop a barrel on the market, right? Because you can keep your children off the street and you can avoid the knock on the door at night. You can be neutral in, from discriminate violence. You can be neutral um, in the face of, of the intelligence. It, it, there's a lot of cases where, where that didn't work out that well, but you can sort of live normally in both, on both sides of the end if you keep your head down. You can't avoid a barrel bomb. If you live in an area that's controlled by the opposition and there's a helicopter hovering overhead and that thing drops, it does not discriminate between your neighbor who may have chanted revolutionary slogans and you who may have kept their head down. The only option you have is to stay put in, in this area where you know the next barrel bomb comes tomorrow or you leave. Either to Turkey or to Europe or to the town you know, free over, which is under government control, where these sorts of things aren't happening. And so what we see systematically, and the, the interesting thing about Syria is that it produced the largest volume of, of data and information any war has ever produced. Very few people have actually analyzed that at, at scale. We were some of the first to do that together with the United Nations. Um, what we see from 2012, when these large swaths of territory fall into their hands, is that the Syrian government consolidates front lines around territories that they can actually hold. And what they do then is they take long range weapons, um, air the Air Force, uh, artillery, and they systematically depopulate areas and uh, sort of undermine government function in areas of opposition. And from this is about 2012, uh, we see a sort of escalation. So in the spring of 2012, we see the first time jets being used against um, uh, opposition held areas. Uh, then we see the first ballistic missile. In the summer, we see the first. And as Sam said earlier, by the end of the year, we see the first use of uh, chemical weapons. We sort of the, the final straw. The reason we call the report nowhere to hide is because it sort of broke the sort of very last redoubt that civilians had from hiding from the violence. And it forces absolutely everyone in these areas into a choice. Stay with the opposition and risk death or leave and save your family. 
And this is what happens. So from, from 2012 on, we see these sort of very first, very large population movements and refugee movements first into Lebanon from Homs, um, which is sort of the very first large battle in an urban area in, in the Syrian uh, war. And then it progresses from there. Um, it, there's other tools like starvation sieges, um, the withdrawal of government services. So if you think about 2015, for example, um, in January 2015, you know what happened in, in areas of northern Syria? Um, the school year didn't start. And if you talk to people and in January, and you have, and because the opposition basically ran out of sort of their own funds to run some schools and the government had withdrawn, and if you talk to people and they said, well, so what are you going to do if you can't send your children to school? They're going to say like, well, <laughs> we go to some school. And, uh, and subsequent, you get a, a refugee crisis. Um, so you get basically, the, the, as I said, the destruction of you know, social cohesion and, uh, and, and, and life in, in these areas outside of, of, of opposition control. Um, and you force people into these sort of terrible, terrible binary choices. And this is why you end up with, I'd say actually half is an underestimate, underestimation of the share of the population that's displaced. It's probably closer to two thirds of the population that's displaced. Um, and you end up ruling the ashes. Um, as simple as that. And people who are displaced are vulnerable, they're under your control because they are subject to, you know, IDP, uh, they are aid dependent, they are in camps, they can be monitored, and they no longer have the social network to rely on to mobilize um, protests or any sort of other sorts of engagement. It's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary process of societal brutalization. Sorry to keep going on like that. But <laughs> if, I had to, if I had to put it down to how the Syrian government won, the, won this war, it's by indiscriminate violence leading to mass displacement. So it's a fundamental tool. And this is why everything flows from that, from, from the refugee crisis to reconstruction to everything else flows from the fact that the Syrian government survived but by basically bombing two thirds of its populations out of their home. And if you think that they're gonna let those two thirds back into their homes, you're mistaken. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are a lot of questions I don't know if we, we, we can certainly not answer all, but I want to, to touch, to, to slowly come to an end. I think we have um, a question about ISIS still. Oh, ISIS, yeah, the link between, yeah, yeah, the link between Assad, ISIS, maybe um, Sam, and then we move to two additional blocks of question that we sum up. I mean, can I just say a quick word about Yeah, the, sure, sure. Yeah. I think about the displacement, it is deliberate. I mean, the, 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 the people who were, uh, the henchmen who were empowered by the regime uh, to crack down on, you know, the protesters, uh, some of them told me, like the you know the people who protested against the against uh, our president against against Bashar al-Assad don't deserve to to live. They don't deserve to remain in Syria. We actually want to get them out of Syria. So uh, usually under the guise of like urban planning or fighting terrorists, I mean the, the excuses varied. Like starting from 2012 when I was in Syria, I, I saw with my like members of the the fourth division, which is under the command of uh, of Bashar's, I don't know if you can hear me. So yeah, I saw okay. with my own eyes in 2012, the fourth division, which is under the command of Bashar's brother, Maher, blowing up buildings in an area uh, just outside Damascus because it, it was known to be uh, an area that harbored opposition and, and rebel fighters. Uh, in Homs, it was very deliberate. I mean, empty the area of civilians. The, 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 the regime called it cleansing. It had a name for it, you know, a cleansing campaign. Uh, hello? Hello, we hear you, yes. I, at least I hear you. <laughs> Your screen is frozen, but we can hear you. All right. Maybe it's, it's at the moment, he needs some time to, to come back. Uh, maybe that gives us an opportunity to move to the, <laughs> uh, while we're waiting for Sam to, to, to come back, um, gives you an opportunity to move to the two additional blocks of question. The one is um, on actors. Uh, on different actors, and the other maybe is the last block um, we should then use to, to, to wrap up on um, what to do in the future. So maybe on actors, could you could you um, answer to be as a bit the question: um, um, Is the UN support helping the Syrian people, or rather supporting um, Assad in the end with the humanitarian aid? What's um, you? Ah, Sam, he is, he's coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Sam. <laughs> maybe, maybe before um, Tobias was about to ask another answer another question. Maybe maybe you you finish your point. Um, if, if your screen was freezing. Shall I finish my point? Yeah, sure. That may, may be good. Yeah. Okay. So now I was just saying that the the uh, the displacement is deliberate. I mean, the regime uh, 
called it, uh, uh, they wanted to cleanse these areas of people. Uh, so, so they wanted to remove people from these areas. All, all of it was, was, was deliberate on the part of the regime. We have to remember that. And we also have to remember that uh, the world largely watched as the regime was doing that later on in the conflict in 2016 and 17 and 18 and in Aleppo and Ghouta. Uh, I mean, the world that says that, that it doesn't want you know, Syrian refugees was watching how more refugees were created without pretty much doing anything to stop it. So uh, on the point of ISIS and Assad, I think it's very important to go back to Iraq. Uh, we have evidence, the US military has evidence uh, that Bashar al-Assad was supporting the insurgency in Iraq in, in, in a very fundamental and, and, and extensive manner. Um, I mean, the, the would-be uh, jihadists, the would-be suicide bombers would arrive at Damascus airport. They would be driven to the border by Syrian security uh, uh, forces and told, here's Iraq, go over there and kill the Americans and the infidels. Uh, the regime was allowing uh, uh, preachers in, inside Syria to preach jihad against the Americans. And it was a way for the regime to get rid of young and restless people who may pose a, a threat for the regime. So, so just have them go to Iraq and blow themselves up. Uh, and then when the regime wanted to uh, engage, you know, with the West, and when America itself, you know, th there was something called the Iraq Study Group uh, in 2007 that said uh, one of the ways to get out of the, the swamp of Iraq is to engage with Bashar al-Assad and Iran. Uh, then the regime felt it had leverage. So it could tell the Americans, I can stop the suicide bombers from going to Iraq. I can close down the training camps that he had on the border between uh, Iraq and Syria uh, for, for Al Qaeda, basically. Uh, but uh, uh, in return, you have to lift sanctions. You have to treat me as the, you know, legitimate sovereign leader of this country and no longer as a pariah. And they engaged with him. We saw that between 2000 seven and 2010, mainly the Americans and the French, and maybe to, to a lesser extent, you know, the, the European Union. Uh, so what, he, what did he do in 2008? He arrested many of the Syrians that were coming back uh, from Iraq and put them in prison and told the Americans, look, you know, these are people he had actually allowed to go there himself. And it was a way for him to show the Americans that he was cooperating. And then the uprising starts. The first thing he does is he releases these people from prison in 2011. He abandons, you know, large areas of the country, including, you know, a, a crucial and strategic border crossing between uh, Mosul, the city of Mosul, which later becomes, the, you know, the capital of the cap Caliphate, and Hasaka province in Syria. And in fact, you know, the, I interviewed the officers who were in charge of that border crossing. And they told me we could have actually defended it, but the orders came from Damascus to leave. So there was a deliberate uh, uh, strategy on the part of the regime to cede all of these areas to ISIS and see ISIS cannibalize uh, the rest of the uh, you know, opposition fighters, the rebels, even the Nusra Front, so that the regime and its allies can focus on defending Damascus, the capital, uh, the coastal area, key cities. Uh, we don't have evidence of like, you know, direct relationship, but we know that, you know, that the regime didn't want to fight ISIS. Uh, we know that the regime, some in the regime, like businessmen actually had dealings with ISIS in terms of uh, uh, oil and, and food and, and all of that. But we don't have concrete evidence the way we have it in Iraq. Uh, you know, where, where actually the regime provided direct support to the Islamic State of Iraq. Uh, so I would say this should be really a cautionary lesson uh, when, when we hear politicians in Germany or elsewhere in Europe talk about uh, cutting a deal with Bashar al-Assad, because, you know, deals were cut with him in the past, both with him and his father, and really that has to be kept, you know, in mind when we talk about re-engaging this regime. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, um, maybe Tobias to the question to the UN and how role the, the humanitarian aid. And afterwards, I would like to ask you, Sam, a question about, uh, we had a question coming up 
from from the from the audience about the the role of the U.S. during the conflict and maybe also in the future how it how it might look like if there is if, if there is any and um, then after that after these two questions we have a final about the outlook and then we should should close because we're coming um, over the time and unfortunately we have far more questions we cannot answer every one of them now. But maybe we can do a written, um, I can cluster them and we can give a written answer, a, a PDF uh, file which we can load up at our homepage. Maybe that would be a, a thing to do. But now, to be us on, um, is the UN um, helpful? Uh, I, uh, that's that's oh, polemic, uh, um, what I say. Helpful or not uh, in, in terms of your humanitarian aid? It's really, really complicated, um, <laughs> to, to say the least. Um, so I don't think. The United Nations as such ever approached this conflict, you know, in the, with the desire to make it worse. Um, but there are sort of fundamental realities about how the international system works. So the United Nations does not operate inside a country without the consent of the government. In Syria, this was already somewhat softened from 2014 onwards through something called a cross-border aid resolution, in which the United Nations would only notify the Syrian government for providing aid to areas outside of its control. Um, but these only covered basically places that you could drive through across the Turkish, Jordanian, um, and the Iraqi borders. Um, for, 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 for a lot of other places inside the country, including sort of large besieged areas around Damascus, Homs, and so on, um, you had to, if you wanted to provide aid, go through what's known as the Damascus hub, um, the sort of UN agency uh, presence inside regime-held areas. And the Syrian government, from the very, very beginning, realized that that was a lever that they could use in war because they realized that fundamentally we weren't going to try and let the Syrians starve so we were going to provide aid that aid would have to go to Damascus and so they were going to and they would have to provide permission for the United Nations to deliver anything anywhere because they had to sign off on security um, guarantees for, for, for these areas. and so the Syrian government very very deliberately started weaponizing aid access against areas outside of its control directly by forbidding um, aid convoys, by sometimes basically robbing them. So they would basically have the UN prepare a convoy, drive up to the checkpoint, and then militias would show up and basically take out anything that they didn't want these areas to have. So what you have left is sort of, you know, bandages and a little bit of, of aid that was not you know, sort of most urgently needed. And so you would go, some of these areas would go years without receiving international aid. And because of fear, of actually getting kicked out entirely out of the system, the United Nations and the international United Nations system never actually caused much of a fuss about this, um, if we're quite honest. The, the Syrian government used other um, measures of sort of trying to influence that, so they denied visas um, to humanitarians and sort of international um, uh, actors who were perceived to be too, a little bit too human rightsy, or maybe from countries that were considered hostile to the Syrian government so that the UN effort would be staffed by people who were more friendly to the Syrian government line. It for years um, refused technical things like um, it's known as uh, severity indicators for the humanitarian response plan. So that humanitarian aid would not be allocated according to severity of need inside the country, but only to need. And since most of the country is technically aid and in, in need of aid, you know, it, it allows the government to steer more broadly. Um, it, it's sort of an outer layer, I think, of the sort of broader system of violence that the Syrian government brought to bear against populations outside of it's so there's, there's a lot of uh, there's, there's endless stories um you should read our newsletter if you want more um, because it's continuously ongoing um the sort of uh, grand uh corruption a lot of the sort of chief implementers the united nations doesn't implement most of its own aid inside the country uh, naturally it sort of buys it sort of has local uh implementers but the syrian government doesn't um you know allow civil society or independent uh, sort of you know, most of these implementers are registered with the Syrian government, and they are affiliated and owned by members of the of the um, of the inner circle of the of the Assad family. The, one of the largest implementers, the Syria Trust, uh, is uh, is Bashar Assad's wife. Um, another large implementer, the Bustan Association, is uh, Rami Mahlouf, his cousin. Which actually, this association also runs a, um, a militia uh, program throughout the country. It's the largest nationwide implementer. It goes on and on and on. It, it, and in that process, it obviously subsidizes food salaries, everybody along the way. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a system that they've set up and we were never really willing because in the end, the government knew that we weren't going to withdraw humanitarian aid from, from these areas. Second order is the negotiations. Um, and there we have a sort of a, a long trajectory of failure. 
um, at least sort of the, the, the early, Kofi Annan was obviously the, the first to try um, and give up relatively quickly. Uh, Lachta Brahimi was the second and probably the most honest um, broker in that he basically resigned saying, this is impossible, the Syrian government is never going to let this happen. Um, Stefan de Mistura tried for the longest time and was somebody who really sort of took himself back and desperately tried to get something off the ground in the process the Syrians sort of continuously disrespected him. Um, he met Bashar once and never again after um, and was basically ignored from then on out. And the current um, UN sort of negotiations effort is basically a subtrack of the Turkish-Russian negotiation channel. So basically the UN gets to do what the sort of two big powers who, who negotiate the North, Turkey and Russia are allowed to do, such as the UN constitutional process. So the UN has provided loads of aid um, throughout Syria for millions of Syrians, without which Syrians would have starved and died and been immiserated, without which the Syrian government would have likely collapsed because it wouldn't have been able to provide um, alternative services, um, and which it provided in a manner that was impartial and not um, you know, up to the standards that we usually set for the provision of this uh, kind of uh, uh, aid. And th the result is a huge loss of credibility for the United Nations um, on, uh, along all sectors of Syrians. So if you deal with Syrians today in track two negotiations, they prefer to deal with the Russians over the United Nations. They do not trust the United Nations to function impartially on outside the Syrian. At least the Russians have some sort of leverage, they say, usually. Um, this is a problem for accountability today. So some of the large accountability organizations, such as the Independent Investigative Mechanism, the IIIM, um, is a UN body, um, which is supposed to compile the evidence of war crimes for national prosecutions on Syria. Um, but because it's a UN body, Syrian organizations who have the evidence and access to the witnesses needed um, fundamentally distrust the process and think that it's fundamentally a, a Russian front in many cases. It, it, it is a disaster for, for international humanitarianism what went down. Okay, we, we should we should come to an end because um, I promised one hour talk. Now we are a bit over it already. But um, Sam, could you um, very briefly maybe elaborate on the role of the United States that it played in the conflict and how it might change in the future? Maybe if we look at if someone uh, if the, if there's changes changes in the um, U.S. leadership um, in in November, maybe is there can give a hint on that or will it stay the same? Yeah, I mean, you have to remember, it all started in Syria in 2011 as the Americans were coming out of Iraq. I mean, Obama pro promised the American people no more Iraqs, no more uh, these, these expensive foreign wars. In fact, he said, we have to pivot away from the Middle East. I mean, that was his pledge. And the Middle East comes back to suck him in. He doesn't want to be involved. I mean, yes, he's telling Bashar leave and we've lost legitimacy, but he feels things could be worked out through the UN, through the, uh, the Arab League. And then th there's also um, uh, the priorities of the Obama administration at the time. He was more interested in uh, forging you know, a nuclear deal with Iran than confronting Iran and Syria. Uh, and so th those were the priorities of the Obama administration, uh, which also, I mean, the risk here is there was this vacuum that was filled by uh, countries that were supposed to be allies of the United States in the region, working for the same goals as the United States, Turkey, Qatar, and, 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 and Saudi Arabia. But the problem is these countries were working at cross purposes. So whenever you had a new opposition body that was set up, or whenever the US announced that the rebels were coming together under a new umbrella group to make sure, you know, uh, we support the moderates and we give them the arms that they need to face this regime. Immediately, there would be infighting amongst these cu countries. The Saudis would go in and tell, uh, you know, some uh, former general, uh, that, you know, here's, here's money, come to our side. Uh, so these countries were working at cross purposes. At some point, you know, when Qatar was completely like sidelined, it decided to support uh, a lot of the uh, uh, Islamist groups uh, who were in turn working with the Nusra Front. So you had factions, uh, you know, hardline factions supported by Qatar and Turkey and other factions supported by Saudi Arabia who were at cross purposes. So it was a total disaster. And then when the Russians stepped in, it was almost like a godsend for the Americans to say like, okay, 
ha let the Russians and Putin deal with it. And yes, the Americans were publicly condemning, you know, the Russian airstrikes, but they were doing nothing to stop them because, I mean, the Russians actually went after groups that were supposedly being backed by the Americans. I, I mean, the first Russian strikes went after these people, not, not ISIS, not Al-Nusra Front. And the Americans, uh, apart from, you know, statements of, of condemnation, they did nothing to stop it. So they were more, more than happy to see Putin step in and take, up, take over the load. And then now with the current administration, they're absolutely not interested in, in, in any of this. Absolutely. Add to that that, you know, the coronavirus, the pandemic here in the U.S., uh, I mean, this is unprecedented. And also add to that uh, what you could call an uprising in the U.S., you know, people calling for uh, racial equality and uh, calling an end to this militarized style of policing. So Americans' hands are really full. And we're talking about also an election year. Uh, so even these sanctions right now, you know, that, 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 that were announced, I mean, got who knows how they're going to be uh, implemented, whether they're going to be sustained, whether they're going to be enforced, uh, uh, you know, uh, consistently. So really, it's an open question. But the trend is America moving further away from, from both Syria and, and, and the larger Middle East. Mm, okay. Maybe a last question, because a couple of audience, uh, people from the audience asked it. It's not easy to answer. Maybe it's not un answerable at all. But I ask it anyway, um, is there a chance somehow to find a political solution on the international level or for Syria? Maybe very brief, both of you, and then we, we finish. Um, Tobias, please. <laughs> uh, not, not as a product of, the, not, not as an expression of the will of the Syrian people, let's put it like this. Um, okay. What can happen is that, you know, we have a sort of grand game right now in the Eastern Mediterranean between sort of various powers and multiple of these theaters, the Turks and Russians are facing down, be it in, in Libya, be it in, in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, be it in uh, Syria. Uh, and, for, and in Syria in particular, they're sort of the, the last power brokers. Turkey has become the principal sponsor of the Syrian opposition. The Syrian opposition is entirely dependent for its survival and for the areas under its control, the survival of the areas under its control on the Syrian, uh, on the Turkish military. Um, and, you know, Russia becomes the principal shield and backer of the Syrian government. So there is a scenario under which basically Turkey and Russia come to a grand bargain between themselves and punt that one down to the United Nations to sort of stamp by their proxies. Um, I wouldn't bet on especially Bashar signing whatever they agreed on, um, simply because they have been quite intransigent and have been quite offended by past Russian attempts to sort of enforce political solutions on them, um, because it, it, it sort of reverses their, their leverage. Um, but there's no, you know, process that channels the voices of Syrians, the legitimate aspirations of Syrians into a political solution that just simply doesn't exist. And none of the actors involved are interested in it existing. In the, in the most recent summits, you know, the, the ceasefire deal, for example, for the Northwest that stopped the last major offensive that displaced the military, displaced the million Syrians, they didn't even bother to translate the, um, the final agreement into Arabic. Um, it existed in English, Russian, and Turkish. Um, <laughs> the Syrians are, are, are large, I would say. Sam, what's, what would be your take? Yeah, my, my take is don't uh, underestimate or discount the will of the Syrian people. Uh, yes, I mean, all these deals and agreements and political solutions could be hatched by, you know, the UN and all these power brokers. But at the end of the day, uh, you've got 7 million Syrians outside the country. M the vast majority of them will not go back as long as this regime is in power. Uh, many of them are actually talking about justice and accountability right now. I mean, look at, mm. look at what's happening in Germany. I mean, these are like Syrian human rights lawyers, Sy Syrian uh, uh, activists that are leading the charge uh, and being supported by their German allies to uh, make this regime pay for its war crimes. Mm. So the that's number defense. one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two is you have to remember that Syrians, even the ones that are still living in the country, have been completely transformed by what happened in the past 10 years. They're, they're not going back to how things were. And, 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 and I think you just have to look at the protests right now that are happening. Yes, they're still small. And yes, the regime is cracking down and arresting people. 
but nothing can go back to the way it was. So you, you can actually have a political solution and you can announce it in, in Geneva and all of that, but nothing will work unless it's acceptable to the Syrian people at the end of the day. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. And thank you to all the participants um, who wrote a lot of questions and maybe we can find a way to answer them um, in a written format. Um, this was the first um, episode of our, um, of our uh, webinar series, which will continue. Um, and on Tuesday, we will have a next round on discussion, which will focus um, on external powers. And we have with us um, Daniel Gerlach um, from CENIT and Ben Tischella from the Böll, Heinrich Böll Foundation. And we will talk about uh, external powers. So all you participants, if you want to join us, it will be Tuesday, half past six. You will, you will get an, a link as well. So thank you, um, Sam. Thank you, Tobias, for, for joining us. And um, with that, we uh, end the, the talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.